Uh, we have uh, David Pietro Monaco today. We have as a speaker. Uh, he has been the in the semiconductor industry for almost 30 years at HP, Sony, and most recently at ARM. Uh, actually, out of that 30 years, 20 years has been with ARM. Um, he works in ARM research uh, in the devices, circuits, and systems group, specifically on the technology optimized design team. Um, the team uh, tries to look five to 10 years uh, ahead to understand the future competing technologies and how to utilize them. I absolutely love the title of the talk. Uh, I'm curious to know more about what lies between the end of the CMOS scaling and future technologies. So uh, again, thank you for agreeing to uh, give a talk at our seminar series. Uh, floor is yours. I'm going to full screen this and we're uh, just going to enjoy the talk. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. All right, um, so I'm going to talk today, uh, as you said, uh, mind the gap. What lies between the end of CMOS scaling and future technologies? That um, sort of uh, hints what I think about the uh, uh, CMOS scaling, <laughs> that I think it's ending, and I'm going to make that argument, I think, pretty persuasively to you. Uh, but don't worry, even though there's like burning stuff in the background here uh, for me, then uh, uh, it's 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 not all doom and gloom. There's actually it's actually a good story. So so let's uh, see. Uh, first of all, I, I do work with other research labs, foundries and companies, and and I know a lot more than I can tell you. <laughs> and so I won't be telling you everything that I know and everything that I'm going to tell you, you can actually go out and look up yourself and find out that somebody has said it somewhere uh, in public. So, um, but that doesn't mean that I haven't pieced together all the important stuff that you can find out in public and put it together because you can find a lot of stuff out in public. <laughs> so, in any case, um, I, I do kind of hate I, agenda slides, uh, but I'm gonna do one anyway because uh, uh, I don't want you to get the feeling about halfway through, it's like, oh my gosh, we're all doomed, you know? Because uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll talk a little bit about ARM and ARM research, and uh, and a little bit about the history of the semiconductor industry, and why the end of scaling is finally here. And and I know everybody's been saying that for years, my entire career they've been saying that, but no, it, it's really here this time. And uh, we'll see if you can uh, reevaluate your <laughs> reevaluate your career choices. It's not too late. No, no, I, I'm kidding. You don't have to do that yet. And uh, uh, there are new technologies on the way. Maybe not what you think, but uh, it, it's actually um, pretty good news. So, so stay with me. It, it'll be interesting. Um, let me talk a little bit about ARM. Uh, years ago, when I first started working at HP, I'd tell people, I work at HP, and they would go, great, can you get me a job? And and then later, when I worked at Sony, I'd go, hey, I work at Sony. Everybody would be like, great, can you get me a TV? And then when I worked at ARM, I'd say, hey, I work at ARM, and everybody would go, what? <laughs> and so uh, now it's not quite that bad. Uh, we're getting a little bit more famous now, I think. Um, we just shipped our... Uh, 200 billion chip with partners and so you know that that's a lot of chips <laughs> and so um we we uh started off as a as a spin-off of acorn computer um, 30 something years ago about and uh to make um, microprocessors for apple's newton little personal assistant that that never really took off uh, i think it was just ahead of its time and uh, and since then, things really took off, I think, when we started to get uh, into uh, cell phones and cell phones started taking off and stuff like that. Because we were always sort of a low power um, portability sort of compute company. And it was just, it took a long time before people really got into low power portability compute. <laughs> so um, I'm in ARM research and uh, we do we partner with people, we work together, we try to develop our ARM ecosystem as well as, you know, general technology for the entire semiconductor industry as well. That's, you know, we, we, we're a big part of that big team bringing chips to, to the future. And so um, uh, there's, um, within ARM research, 
There's uh, education programs, our research programs, external collaborations. And within the research programs, there's a lot to do with CPUs, obviously, because we're a big CPU, but we do you know, research into uh, GPUs and machine learning and, and system architecture stuff. And the little one that's highlighted is device circuits and systems. That's where I'm at. And what we look at um, within that is sort of the future of computing technology, where it's going, where the technology is going, where the computers are going, where the chips are going, where the transistors are going, all that stuff. And the technology optimized design group, which I'm in, is specifically targeted to look at the future of technology and where it's going. Um, and so I'm gonna look a little bit at the five to 10 year realm because um, hey, that's what I'm most familiar with, but I think it's more interesting to see where things are going and, and where the CMOS gaps are. And so I'll talk about what we see in technology um, and a little bit about printed electronics and the reason I'll do that. Um, but first, a compulsory comment about Moore's Law, <laughs> because what future looking technology talk would be complete without commenting about Moore's Law? And so um, Moore's, uh, well, originally said that, uh, noted that uh, transistor density was doubling about every year, but by the time scale that it became important and everybody started looking at it, it was about every two years. And, and that became in the public's mind an expectation that cost, power, and performance would all improve as well as long as everything was scaling. Um, but that wasn't really part of Moore's law. The transistor density doesn't really directly affect the power, cost, and performance. That's Denard scaling, which was, as he noted, that uh, as transistors get smaller, the power density stayed constant. And in order to do this, the devices were changing. The, the gates had to get thinner so the voltages could go down and all this stuff happened so that um, uh, to make what we think about Moore's Law true, Moore's Law is really just about lithographic scaling. But, but what made all that good stuff happen was that lithographically scaling transistors down and modifying them got you a whole bunch of benefits. Um, so unfortunately, Dinard scaling ended a long time ago. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and so you can actually see on the charts of power performance and wattage and stuff when exactly it died. Uh, it was about 2004. And, um, but strangely, Moore's Law didn't stop, right? The, the transistor count um, just, kept, just kept going up. Um, and then, so how did the trans how did the chips get better during this time, right? Um, it, it's all materials and gimmick gimmickry, <laughs> strain engineering, high K metal gates, low K dielectrics. You know, lots of engineering other than scaling is what made um, the performance stay Im improving and the power improving and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, and the one at the end, this graph is a little older, I pulled from somewhere. Um, but right at the end of this graph, the FinFET comes in. And I'm gonna make a big deal about the FinFET for a minute because um, you can argue it's just another incremental improvement on all those magical miracle materials like you know copper and strain engineering and all this other stuff, right? There's a, a huge litany of, of what's happened. But, um, Oh, actually, my pointer has to be on this screen. <laughs> there, you can see my pointer. Um, but more subtly, we went from a, a flat, planar, 2D sort of world to a subtle 3D sort of world. And um, I think that's important and, and understated somewhat about the significance of FinFET, was that there was really no way to make a planar device better. The only way to go was into 3D. And so um, I'll get back to that. So things were still scaling, right? So is Moore's Law still good? Um, well, Litho's still scaling, which is really incredible. I mean, if you look at what an EUV machine does with, you know, zapping lasers into drops of molten metal and stuff to create X-rays, essentially X-rays, then yeah, it's it's uh, astounding. And the devices are still scaling. We've got nano sheets on horizon, and there's fork sheets just beyond that. But I'm going to argue that the problem here is that there's once we get past high numerical aperture UV, which is hopefully going to come in a few years, 
There's nothing else. There's no more way to scale lithography. That's it. Um, there's scaling in devices, sure, but they're not getting smaller. The nano sheets actually are somewhat bigger than thin fets. And once you get to fork sheets, they're not any smaller than nano sheets. They're actually bigger as well. They're just closer together. And so um, there is no more scaling there. <clears throat> and another thing I would like to point out is that while we scaled uh, planar devices for decades and we scaled fin fets for years, you know, we're bringing the new devices on at the limit of the scaling, right? The devices are the scaling. They're not going to scale. And so, you know, when nanosheets arrive, they'll be maybe scaling for one or two generations and fork sheets will be one. And so um, they're, they're not, they're not a scaling, um, they're a scaling booster. They're not a new step to more scaling. And it's worse than that, actually. <laughs> the, um, uh, when we switched to copper, it was kind of uh, aluminum was really friendly. It didn't damage the other devices. Copper would really very much like to destroy everything on the chip. And so uh, we've kept it in place with thick liners and um, uh, nitrides and, and um, uh, barriers to keep it during processing from basically drifting out and contaminating everything else. But there's not much copper left within those barriers and liners. As we try to shrink the, the copper wires, it becomes mostly barrier and liner and very little copper is left. And so there's, we've actually reached the point where um, foundries have backed off shrinking the copper wires because shrinking them more kills performance. There's too much resistance and, and, um, uh, and it kills power consumption. And so that's starting to get to its limit as well. Uh, ruthenium and cobalt, um, uh, some foundries have been struggling to put those in and move to ruthenium soon. A, they're really expensive. B, they're actually not lower resistance. They just don't have the liners. And so it doesn't actually um, improve anything. It just lets you kind of cross over to something else and, and it doesn't really get better. It just allows you to do it. Um, and there's really, we've really reached the limit of what we can make a device. Um, the poly pitch limit, the, the spacing of which the poly um, occurs is about to 40 nanometers now. It has been for a while, very close to it. And that's about it. Otherwise things just fall apart. Um, the fin pitch limit right now is, you know, it's getting closer to 20 nanometers, which is about the limit that they can process with regular EUV. Um, with high numerical aperture UV, I think it'll go to about 16 before they aren't structurally sound and they fall apart. And also we can go to one pitch too, just one fin. But that's it. There's nothing that on this planet that we figured out how to make a smaller fin um, at this point. That seems to be the device limit for if we try to make a device smaller than that, it, it simply is not possible to keep it together. And um, this takes us down another couple of nodes, right? People are talking about three nanometer now. So depending on how you count your nodes and stuff, then maybe the two to one, and then that's it. There's no more thing to scale. Um, so that's scaling done, right? We're, we're dimensionally, we're just about it now. Um, devices aren't going to get any smaller. Um, but none of us are ready to hang up our badges and go home. <laughs> and so you say, but how are you going to get out of this if you can't actually scale anything down anymore? So I will pose the question to you, what's beyond CMOS scaling, right? This was the point of my talk. Well, as our, as our group, we look at other technologies, spintronics, graphene, uh, uh, magnetic tunnel junctions, even qubits. We've looked at all these things. We've looked at uh, uh, carbon nanotubes. So I'm going to say more CMOS. <laughs> and the reason is nothing else is really ready. Um, and, and CMOS has a few tricks up its sleeve yet. And so let's talk about 
how CMOS is going to overcome the impossible and, and bridge this gap to the future of post-CMOS <laughs> scaling. So what we're talking about is shrinking without scaling. Right? We're going to do some stuff. And these are things that we in our research team have researched, um, moving, reducing the signal wires and therefore lowering the capacitance and resistance. So you're not really shrinking anything, you're moving things around. And so if you move the power circuits to the back side of the chip, um, that leaves you more room to, to work on the front side. Uh, there's 3D chip stacking, and, and I'm not talking about just package optimization, right? We've been using chiplets and things for a while. People have been cramming more chips into a, into a package. And, and, and the, if you wanna get the package smaller, you have to start stacking those things up. I'm not talking about that. I'll get into more about what that is. And then actually stacking the transistors um, looks possible as well. So in other ways to improve things, you can look at uh, cryogenics. We've been looking into that as well. Um, that may sound a little far-fetched, um, but it's not intended for your cell phone. <laughs> it's more like data centers and stuff like that. It's not as far-fetched as that seems. And then I'm gonna make an aside here and, and talk about uh, plastics. Um, it's like the 1963 advice, invest in plastics. Um, I'm not gonna go that far, but it's an interesting thing to look at and, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, so we'll get there. Oh, and yeah, okay. So 3D stacking. Um, if you stack layers of your design in 3D, that's the first kind of stacking. And so we'll slice up the the design into tiers. Like here's like um, two pieces of design, right? And um, if I stack them, the wires that were long can get short. But unless you do it with a lot of uh, CAD support, the wires that used to be short can get long. And so this is not easy to do right now because there's not really 3D CAD support for doing this. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what we did in trying to figure out whether this works or not. But um, you can stack your chips this way, but without some, some serious you know, improvement in, in CAD, you're not gonna get as much out of it as, as you, other than just sort of the the improvement in density in your packaging, you can add some more RAM if you stack it on top because there's space for it there. Um, but that's not this. Now, if you stack the transistors, you don't have that issue because the whole design shrinks, all the wires get better, right? And what we've done is we've moved the, the uh, uh, NRPs on top of the other NRPs. This is the complementary FET, the C FET. And uh, there is work going on in this. You can look at a lot of different companies looking at doing this. It's basically an extension of the nanosheet. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail of this too. Um, here's some of the stuff that we've actually looked at though. Um, in backside power, we started looking at it way back in 2018, <laughs> an eternity in chip years. Uh, the um, what happens currently is that in 2D, the power routing blocks the signals. You have these giant stacks where power has to come in from the top, get down to the devices, and, and then the grounding has to go back out the top and, and go. And this blocks a lot of your signal routing capability. Also, it has a lot of IR drop. And so as the, um, there's a couple of things going on. One is that as the, uh, um, density of the scaling causes the transistors to get closer and closer together, the power density that you have to deliver goes up. And the resistance of these networks starts to become very lossy when you're shoving more and more power through, unless you add more and more power support for all that density, but then you run out of, there's not more routing happening. And so you fall into this sort of category where the front side power delivery just can't deliver enough power to the dense structures you're trying to make. But if you if you actually modify things a little bit uh, on the front side, you can add more power delivery in, but then your performance actually goes down, which is why this power frequency you know, um, metric is getting worse. You actually want lower performance per, or lower power for performance. Graphs are backwards. 
I stole it from someone. Um, and so uh, that's not a good solution either. And what you'll see now is that founders are talking about moving to fully backside power. Um, we have papers on this and stuff. And by pulling the, the, the power delivery networks out of the front, shaving off the back of the wafer and then building them on the back, you can deliver power to the backside. Uh, people have been shaving wafers off on the back and putting stuff on the backside for a while. The image sensor people have, have been doing it. Sony sort of pioneered that. Um, so it's it's not a it's not a it's not a new thing, but it's it's new in this regard in in applying it to our sort of standard design. And uh, this will probably show up. I think they'll be forced to it um, because of the power. Uh, re uh, uh, issues more than the scaling issues, you'll probably start seeing this around the three nanometer nodes or something, three to two. So um, we worked on 3D stacking. Um, this is face-to-face uh, -face bonding. This is not uh, the sort of, uh, this is basically turning two chips into one big mega chip as opposed to just stacking another chip on top of a chip and having some local connection between them. So like a, a memory cache or, uh, you know, something just stuck on top of a chip that you're accessing like it was next to it, but it's just over it. No, this is actually trying to make these two um, fold together and become a, um, a single unit. And like I said, we didn't have any EDA tools <laughs> to do this. And so we sort of invented our own recipes for splitting the circuits up and um, and uh, uh, trying to trick the 2D placement route tools into making a acceptable 3D solution. Um, and I won't go into all those details, but it did work. And even with the not fully optimized sort of 3D solutions, you're looking at 15 to 20% improvements in power performance. Um, depending on what you're measuring. So significant gains to be had by going into 3D. Um, and like I said, even more should be available. Uh, going into 3D transistors, we've been looking at this since, I don't know, 2019. And uh, like I was hinted at before, this is basically an extension of nanosheets. If you're gonna make stacked devices in a nanosheet, um, why not make them all of the different flavors of devices you want instead of just one flavor and then putting another flavor next door? And so that's the idea, is that you stack the, um, the, the P's below the N's or N's above the P's or whatever, however you want to arrange it. You get a little bit ability to do some straining, I think, if you stack it the right way. Um, and so this basically gives you about half of the cell size that you would experience normally with having the things next to each other. And so uh, again, what you're looking at doing is reducing the, the amount of wire. You're not shrinking the wires, you're not shrinking the devices, but by going to 3D, because I've been able to stack these in 3D, um, I've shrink I've shrunk the distance between things and therefore lowered the capacitance and lowered the resistance between wires. So in other words, what's happening is we're not talking about scaling the individual components anymore. We're talking about technologies that allow us to scale the size of the whole chip by putting more of it closer to it. So you're looking at volumetric um, uh, um, optimization instead of area optimization. Area is so 2D, it's so last year. And, and so, now it's it's all these technologies really focus on reducing volume. And the worst thing for volume is of course a big flat plane. <laughs> Go back to your math class and you'll see that a big flat plane is basically the maximum volume that you can have. And so um, there's a lot of scaling that can happen in volumetrically. Um, uh, taking a, a slight detour, if you look at what we can do in more general, instead of the volumetric um, uh, fixing, we can look at entirely new optimizations. Uh, data centers are going to much more effort to cool chips than they used to. Um, there's now 
practically hurricane forces going through the data center, cooling the, the thing. It's not quite that strong, but it's really, it's dangerous to go inside a data center now unless everything's shut off. And so um, uh, you uh, get into the point where we've looked at analyzing the actual devices. If you cool them down, say not even to liquid nitrogen, but above those temperatures, but but where you require refrigeration as opposed to just passive cooling or active cooling. But you see that device performance goes up tremendously, um, but it does take some modification to the devices themselves. They've, we've tuned all our devices to work at room temperature well or high temperature well, not at low temperatures. And what happens is the VT goes up significantly as the temperature drops. So the mobility gets better, it goes up, the resistance goes down, it gets better. The sharpness of the curve at which the transistor turns on you know, becomes more of an on-off switch as opposed to having a big gray area of it sort of kind of on. And so all of these things are improved, but with the higher VT, um, they just don't turn on. <laughs> and so this is something though foundries know how to fix, right? You, there's a lot of papers out there by some of the foundries about looking at cryogenic computing. And it's something that if we all get together, um, we, can, we can probably make it happen. So it's, it's something that's not just us, it's something that the industry, you know, is, is starting to approach. Um, but yeah, it's just adding another VT, like, you know, there's, you know, high VTs, low VTs, regular VTs, there's like an ultra, ultra low VT basically to compensate for the cryogenic. So, so that's, um, that's very promising as well, but it's, you know, sort of a, I don't know, one-off thing. Uh, and now for something completely different. Uh, actually, it was iMac that put together the world's first plastic 8-bit microprocessor. Um, iMac, for those who may or may not be familiar, is sort of the industry research consortium. <laughs> uh, it's, it's its own research entity, but a lot of companies participate in their projects, and um, they do a lot of work with pretty much everybody in the semiconductor industry. And a lot of companies have somebody stationed over there and stuff. And, um, you know, they do stuff representative of what the entire industry is looking at. And so they did uh, organic P-type. There's just P transistors. So you may think back to the original um, silicon devices, and there were only N-type transistors, right? The first transist the first chips the first um integrations were n type devices they didn't have p device we didn't have cmos originally and so but now they they have gotten hybrid cmos devices in uh, in plastic and so arm around 2014 decided yeah let's fiddle around with it so we had to make our own plastic libraries we had to make our own you know tooling and stuff to go um standard cell libraries and stuff. We made our own everything. And we made some ring oscillators, some counters, some shifters. And and those turned out to work on plastic. <laughs> and so we thought, well, let's try making a small microcontroller. Um, at first, it was too ambitious. Uh, it was just too big. You just can't the yield isn't tremendous on plastic, as you might imagine. And so uh, we had to do quite a bit of smooshing and design optimizations and stuff to get it down to a, a size that uh, would work. And uh, eventually the, oh, oh, sorry, we were working with Pragmatic, uh, Pragmatic IC. And um, we did get them working and, you know, it's nothing to write home about, it's pretty slow. <laughs> but I pointed out, because uh, let's go back to our sort of Moore's law um, graph here. This is a slightly different version of it, and uh, but the same thing. And you know this this uh, trend over here was the the NMOS trend, right? To the about to the 4004 was one of the last uh, pure NMOS chips. And um, and then after that, it was kind of CMOS, and the scaling slowed down, but everything worked better. Um, if you look at IMEX 
ALU that they made, their 8-bit, and our little plastic arm that we made, you'll see that it's on a trend that corresponds roughly to where CMOS was back at the beginning of its scaling days too, right? And I point this out because all of the technologies have to basically overcome this CMOS technology moat that's built around CMOS. We've put so many years into CMOS, it's very hard for Smintronics or plastics or anything else to even come close to what CMOS is doing. Even if you're on the same sort of exponential growth curve, it will take you decades to get close to where CMOS is. And so um, there is just this tremendous uh, momentum behind CMOS and people are determined to continue. <laughs> and as I show you with 3D, there's quite a bit of space for them to continue. So what are my conclusions for, from all of this? Uh, Moore's Law is super dead. Um, if anybody tells you otherwise, they're, they're not paying attention. Everything it was based on is dead. Denard scaling's dead. The, the you know, dimensional scaling's dead or about to be dead. It's just dead. So long live Moore's Law, yay, it's gonna keep going. <laughs> because uh, the technology improvements in CMOS are still coming. And everybody out there is gonna attribute it to Moore's Law. You're gonna hear Moore's Law, Moore's Law for the rest of you know the decade or more. And um, it just isn't the case. It's not Moore's Law anymore. It's nothing that looks like it, but you know, people have gotten used to it now. And so, um, but you and I, we know better. It's, it isn't really following a Moore's, Moore's Law roadmap anymore. The, the technologies, as soon as somebody makes some new technology to make the process better, it's not gonna sit in a bucket and wait for Moore's Law roadmap. Or so. It's gonna get shoved out there because we're behind, right? And so um, the time of release and, and, the, and the percentage of the benefit it's going to vary widely because whatever technology we've managed to cough up is just going to get shoved out there and become the new process technology. And so, um, but there's a lot of room for more, more stuff. It's, it's not, it's not quitting. So you don't have to hang up your badge. You don't have to go find a new job or anything. <laughs> it's good for a while. I'm, I'm looking, I should make it to retirement at least. So I think it's good. So, but that's my talk. Uh, I don't really have, Anything else? If you have questions or anything, um, I can uh, okay, so do my best to answer. answer. Yeah, great, great talk. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So we actually do have some questions, and I have a question. So I was going to okay. start with the um, questions that we got and the uh, chat. So we have. Let me go from the beginning. So we have a question from Matthew Sharp asking about the heat tolerance on the plastic chips and the concerns. A lot of them melted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I thought again. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, that's also tricky. <laughs> so that's going to take some more work. Uh, I don't think plastic is the is uh, quite ready for prime time yet, um, but um, uh, we were able to make some that didn't melt eventually. And so um, I don't think we've published information about all that yet, so uh, I can't go into super lots of detail, but but yes, it it is possible to do it. So uh, you're not gonna see like computing on your cereal box yet, but, <laughs> but it's coming, it's coming along. That's right. No, I actually like that's a good point. I have my question was a follow up question to this topic. So we have another question, but before going there, I want to ask that too. So for this, uh, let's say the plastic chips that ARM is working on, are we targeting it as a general purpose kind of processor or are we going to talk about a specific application like wearable devices? Yeah. And and this kind of technologies. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's considerably slower than CMOS is now, but it's considerably cheaper. Mm. You're looking at about a cent, a penny, to produce one of the, excuse me, plastic chips in volume. That's that's sort of the expectation. And so, um, you know, you're looking at disposable medical devices. Um, things are already starting to get a little bit towards towards disposable medical devices and stuff like that, or you know. 
heaven knows we're going to make the you know ocean patch worse of plastic stuff but but uh i think it, i think there is a a useful um uh a need for making very very cheap compute available in all sorts of places um uh, we can possibly save power and energy and reduce our carbon footprint if you know light bulbs were smarter and yeah we do that now but but um if you were able to bring compute to lots of places that don't have it and and help health too especially with medical devices and stuff sure so we i see another question uh from Muhammad isa and he I mean, he started with a lot of nice things about the talk, and I agree with him. It was a great talk on the different aspects from device to circuit. Uh, I think the question is, um, you also mentioned that the focus on the EDA tools, because we can only go, um, you know, the progress really depends on what kind of tools we have to develop and use these technologies. So do you see any serious efforts on industry focusing on developing these tools like you know probably the companies the cadence synopsis that they develop this kind of tools or arm by itself you said you had an in-house kind of eda so to maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more. they are working on it yeah they're not there yet but mm -hmm. they're working on it and um i expect that they will probably have it you know, cracked in time by the time we get to the two nanometer, one nanometer node, we really have to start going into 3D designs. They'll probably have, you know, I, I can't, <laughs> I know they're working towards those sorts of goals, whether they'll, whether they'll make it or not, who knows, I can't speculate, but, but they are working on it and, and they, they have the timelines in mind. So. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you also investigated carbon nanotubes, right? You know, uh, but you still think that they can't be potentially. Uh, there's a question from one of Jonathan Sharp again. I mean, uh, what do you what is what do you think about? Maybe elaborate on that a little bit more. Carbon you know, I don't know. The, the the carbon nanotubes is one of the most perplexing things to me. Is if you talk to anybody over at Stanford, they're like, yeah, carbon nanotubes. We're, we've done that, you know. And everybody else is like, hmm, interesting. Back to silicon, you know. <laughs> and so. Um, I, I, I've yet to see it gain any real traction, even though there's a, a small cadre of, of professors and students and stuff that are like, yeah, it, it's great, you know? And so um, uh, we haven't actually quite figured out wh you know, where it really stands um, and, and stuff like that. So you know, like I said, we've, we've been sort of going all in on the 3D stuff uh, because we really see that uh, we really saw the ability to sort of get in on that and sort of drive that um, and the rest of the industry that way. There's there's such a big CMOS moat that I was talking about that if you try to switch to something like a carbon nanotube, to, it, it does replace a lot of the technology and a lot of the momentum that's already there in, in silicon. And so those are very big lifts for the industry to try to do. Even if it's better, it has to be notably better in order for people to um, to to make a jump like that. So. That's right. I assume hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on the manufacturing facilities and changing the entire process might be. Billions, yeah. 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 yeah so, so it's tough. Yeah. So uh, I have one very general question, but I think it's going to be important for a lot of students who are in the uh, meeting and it's about how they can contribute is there any you know phd fellowships or like internships provided to phd students or graduate students so maybe you can elaborate on that as a last question that can help um yeah um the entire industry does you know phd internships arm does too and um uh you know, I should have brought some information along, but maybe I'll follow up later with some, how, how things get contacted and stuff. Uh, we have our general sort of uh, um, uh, applicant, you know, hotlines the same as all the other companies do and stuff too. And and we do go through those and we do look at them. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the problem in research is that, uh, you know, we're looking at stuff that we can't talk about until after we've talked about in which case we're kind of done looking at it <laughs> so it's kind of a big guess you know it's like i wonder if they're looking at that and so and so we look for interns unfortunately based off of stuff that we haven't talked about publicly very much and so um you know there's certainly these areas and stuff uh but 
you know, there may be other areas that we can't talk about yet. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's kind of a catch-22, but I think that's standard across the industry, too. So Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And, again, thank you. Very great talk. You know, I really enjoyed it, and uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Thanks again. All right, thank you.